introducing our panelists. First, we have Dr. Bradshaw. Um, Dr. Marcus Bradshaw is an Associate Professor of Clinical Radiology and Radiological Sciences at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. He actually recently published Together Apart During Coronavirus 2019, Inclusion in the Time of Social Distancing. Next, we have Dr. Katari, who is a Professor of Radiology at the Stanford University Medical Center, and she also recently published in women's health, gender differences in patients' perceptions of physicians' communal traits and the impact of physician evaluations. Next, we have Dr. Yasha Gupta, who's the chief resident at Mount Auburn Hospital, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and she runs a successful YouTube channel addressing radiology topics, including, a discuss including discussions on the importance of diversity. And lastly, but not the least, we have Dr. Johnson Lightfoot who is the ACR Chair, Commission, of, Commission for Women and Diversity. And his research interests lie in improving diversity, inclusion, and representation in the radiological profession. So it's very evident why we chose our panelists tonight. They're not only great in what they do, but are also very active in projecting diversity in the field. So before we begin, I would like to go ahead and ask each panelist what made them say yes to this webinar tonight. Um, we can go ahead and get started with Dr. Bradshaw. Okay, so for me, I recognize that racism is a very difficult topic for people to discuss, but I think it's so important that we gather to discuss these issues so that we can bring different viewpoints to the table and we can begin to address the issues rather than to just act like they're not present because by not discussing it, we're, we're still not addressing it. And so I'm always willing and, and um, able to join any conversation that can move us forward in addressing this very important topic. Yes, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, what, I'm gonna ask the same question to Dr. Gupta also. Yeah, I'm very much in the same boat as Dr. Bradshaw. I'm always the first to you know join in these conversations this was really the reason why we started future rad res it was because you know we the gender gap and also the fact that we have such a small amount of underrepresented minorities within radiology so when i was asked to join the panel i was like oh yeah count me in for sure i'm so glad to hear that i totally agree and dr lightfoot what made you want to say yes and um join our webinar tonight well, thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, first, for the invitation. Um, I see this as an opportunity. Uh, you are the future of radiology. Residents uh, in, uh, at Rowan uh, in your radiology club represent the future of radiology. And, and to the extent that your insights and your contributions to diversity and inclusion uh, are improved and enhanced and amplified, uh, I'm all in favor of doing that. Uh, racism, as you know, is a lemon to be a little understated, uh, it's worse than a lemon, but it also presents an opportunity uh, to make lemonade uh, or lemon chiffon pie. Mm -hmm. That's what we should try to do uh, in, in our current political environment nationally and uh, particularly in the radiological sciences. Thank you for that. Those were really great answers and I totally agree. I'm so glad we're able to meet in this platform in this way, even uh during the pandemic and just to discuss these important topics. Um, next slide. So I just want to put a disclaimer. This dialogue is intended to be a safe space discussion on race. We want to embrace uncomfortable conversations and not shy away from it. It's the human eye that sees different colors which divide and group. It's the environment we grow up in that create bias. Race isn't a biological description, but a social classification made by man. And so I just want to go ahead and define some terms before we get into our questions. So what is racism? Racism is a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on the social interpretation of how one looks. This turns into unfair disadvantages to some individuals and communities. And from this, there's different levels of racism that have been created. First, we have institutionalized racism, which is the differential access to goods, services, and opportunities of society by race. It's almost like we're in, it's almost like inheriting 
disadvantages because it's so established and well incorporated into our society where it continues from grandparents to parents to children and so forth. And this is where we need to break this. We need to hold each other accountable by having these types of discussions in medical education, our clinical offices and home environments. And next we have interpersonal mediated racism, which is the differential assumptions about the abilities, motives, and intents of others by race, and then differential actions based on those assumptions, which include prejudice and discrimination. This can be unintentional or intentional. And I just want to share two personal examples. Um, um, some are intentional and I remember when I was five years old I was in kindergarten and as I tried to play with some girls they said ew you're Indian and brown and because of one of because I was one of the few that looked different and I still remember this incident crystal clear after so long and for a long time I was ashamed of the color of my skin and my culture and others can be unintentional where not too long ago, I was in the hospital where my mom was having surgery and I met one of her phys physicians and she asked me what I did. And I said, I actually just finished the first week of medical school. And she proceeded to ask me, oh, are your parents doctors? I said, no. Her follow up from that was, do your parents own convenience stores? I said, no. As I walked away, I smirked and thought this well-educated person, a physician, judged me in 10 seconds from the color of my skin and profession. The years of hard work and education were put to the side and an ingrained assumption came out of her mouth. So it's extremely, extremely important for us to have these conversations at different levels and recognize assumptions. And so this brings me lastly to internalized racism, which I believe is one of the worst because it's one's own acceptance of the, stigma, of the stigmatized racist negative messages about one's own ability and intrinsic worth, which include self-devaluation. It's the act of accepting limitations to one's full humanity. Um, so I wanna go ahead first and get started to speak to our panelists about interpersonal racism. And just to reiterate in simple terms, it's the assumptions made resulting in discrimination. Uh, next slide. So Dr. Bradshaw, have you ever witnessed or experienced interpersonal racism in practice, whether it be practitioner to patient, patient to practitioner, or practitioner to practitioner? And how did you address this situation? Yeah, unfortunately, um, I can say, uh, if not witness had firsthand knowledge of all of these um, experiences. Um, practitioner to patient, um, I distinctly remember sitting down with a group of uh, graduating fourth years and them telling stories how um, physicians would not call an interpreter and they would just say, oh, the patient will just get it or they will spend more time in a particular patient's room depending on the ethnicity of said patient. And they would go in more detail of the health problem and the potential cure depending on the race of the um, individual that was in the room. And to answer your question in terms of how did we address it, um, I collected the stories, I collected surveys for two different years of the graduating students, and then I presented it to the College of Medicine at that particular institution so that they could no longer say I'm not aware of the difficulties that certain patient populations are experiencing because I had data to show them. Um, in terms of patient to practitioner, I've experienced that myself where you walk into the room and the patient immediately starts to question your cr credentials in terms of are you qualified to take care of me? And I address that very simply by um, just giving them my qualifications. And I found that once I rolled into where I trained and, and um, my qualifications, that they quickly got quiet in terms of whether or not they thought I was qualified and then accepted me as their physician. Um, in terms of practitioner to, to practitioner, um, I've had racism from my prior my prior job i'll just be honest um when i decided to leave that institution it became a big problem because i was the only african-american radiologist in the state and so that institution wanted to keep me there as a quote unquote asset and once i decided to leave it became an issue in terms of 
we're no longer going to allow you to do these four or five things that everyone else at that practice could do and that everyone else when they had given their leave were allowed to do and to address it man i've documented everything number one number two i went to hr and number three i filed an eeoc complaint because if we don't stand up for injustice, then those people feel like yes. they can continue to do it. Great points. And I'm so glad that you mentioned that where you did follow up and you actually did stand up and you did something and didn't stay quiet. Um, I want to ask the same question to Dr. Lightfoot also, if you've ever witnessed or experienced interpersonal racism in practice and how did you address the situation? Uh, <clears throat> fortunately, it's uncommon, but it certainly doesn't occur. You ought to be aware of the perception by many clinicians that African Americans perceive pain differently. And when I was training residents, uh, very often, you, you know, we give local anesthesia for minor procedures such as thoracentesis or paracentesis. And there was a distinct way that some of my residents treated their African American patients in terms of their anesthesia and, and how curtly they treated them. Uh, and how they would dismiss the fear or the pain uh, as, a pair, as compared with their majority patients. So I, I think that phenomenon that's well described, that many uh, clinicians feel that African Americans experience pain differently, is manifested in, in a, a number of ways, mo most, uh, most acutely in, in radiology, in interventional radiology, as simply local anesthesia. Um, with regard to practitioner, um, in a couple of subtle instances, I've had some majority clinicians, fellow radiologists, comment to me about how surprising it is that their new Hispanic or African American resident is doing so well. Uh, simply this uh, expectation, it man it's manifestation of expectation of underperformance by the Hispanic or the Asian or the African American resident. And they'll say, you know, she, she's really pretty good, uh, as, as if that should be a uh, in, in very subtle ways, what might be called microaggressions. It does exist, um, fortunately, not quite to the level that we had back in the 60s, uh, but, uh, but, but they are subtle, uh, pervasive, uh, quite unconscious often, uh, but, but they do need to be recognized. Thank you so much for answering that and just bringing that up. Um, very great points. Um, now I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to my colleague, Brian, who will talk to the panelists about institutionalized racism. Hi, everybody. So we're going to next shift into institutionalized racism. And uh, like we defined it before, um, institutionalized racism is differential access to goods, services, and opportunities by race. So this is things like housing, uh, education, employment, income, and uh, healthcare, especially. Um, so we have a question about healthcare policies for the panelists. In the current pandemic, as a radiologist, how have you seen minority populations disproportionately affected within our healthcare system? So do underrepresented minorities receive less imaging? And then do you notice any particular hospital protocols that were discriminatory or biased towards black patients or patients of color? And I know uh, Dr. Katari is, uh, is, is trying to join the webinar. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started with Dr. Lightfoot, if that's all right. Um, you know, that's an excellent question. And one of the most important things that we do in policy is study the phenomena. And in the COVID area, as you know, nationally, uh, the hospitalization rates for African Americans and Hispanics is two to th three to four times that of the majority population. And the death rate is two to three times. I'm in a hospital that uh, predominantly serves a Hispanic population. And our infectious disease people deliberately studied and looked at the ethnicity of patients who were hospitalized, discharged, or, or deceased. And we actually found no disparity with regard to our Hispanic patients. 
And I think that's in, in no small part due to a couple of reasons. One, we have a large Hispanic medical staff. So that being at the table, at the bedside, at the, at the planning session makes a difference. Um, we have a, a large uh, nursing staff, which is Hispanic. Um, and so, so, so the answer here is no, but for a good reason. And, and that's exactly why we attend to questions of racism. Uh, you can't pretend that they don't exist and you can't ignore them. You measure them. If you find that, 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 that there is a disparity, then you can correct it. But fortunately at our hospital, in no small part because we have Hispanics on the medical staff, administration, nursing staff, uh, we, we've measured and found no disparity, which is a good thing. Thank you, Dr. Lightfoot, for that. Very unfortunate outcomes from this terrible disease, but at least the, the pain is being evenly distributed. Great. Thank you, Dr. Lightfoot. Uh, Dr. Katari, are you on the line now? We're having some technical difficulties get, getting her um, microphone working. Uh, let's see. Okay, well, maybe the microphone's not quite working just yet. Um, Dr. Bradshaw, would you mind uh, talking about this? These two questions? Yeah, I would agree. I don't think that we have, at least in our department, we haven't seen any differences in the um, impact based off the of different um, ethnicities of our patients. I think um, there are some, some, some data, at least some stories out there that show that, you know, minority populations have been slower to come back to the hospital during this pandemic. And I think for good reason, because if you look at, you know, who's being disproportionately affected, um, patients of color are more likely to die from this disease. So they've been more hesitant to come back and get that routine care that I think we've seen some of the other populations get. I think that just goes back to Dr. Lightfoot's point earlier that if you recognize a, a difference in who's coming up and showing up for those appointments, then you have to be intentional about reaching out to those particular uh, patient populations. Right, right, definitely. Um, Dr. Gupta, do you have something to add to these two questions? I agree with um, what both Dr. Lightfoot and Dr. Bradshaw said. I don't know if we have specifically studied it at our hospital, but I don't think that we have specific protocols that were discriminatory. I think everything is pretty standardized at this point, especially when it comes to the pandemic. But definitely, I agree, you have to study it in order to find these issues. So probably we can make some progress in that area. And let's see one more time. Is Dr. Katari, are you able to unmute your microphone? Well, we'll, we'll try again on the next question. Could you go ahead and move the slides forward? Okay, great. So, and now I'm going to hand it off to Rob Martin to talk about uh, the current events and some of the things going on in um, some of the uh, national racial protests. Sorry, my uh, screen's a little bit messed up there. But so uh, currently we were interested in getting a uh, current perspective of, of all our panelists, <clears throat> but due to time constraints, uh, we're just going to ask Dr. Gupta and Dr. Bradshaw this one, but feel free if anybody else is interested in discussing this to jump in. Um, but with current events, how do you feel about uh, national racial protests spurred by the high profile killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and just so many others? Uh, do you feel that's imp impacted healthcare or the field of radiology in any way? Who first? I can go. 
So I think that these events have really shined a light on the lack of diversity and the lack of representation within radiology of underrepresented minorities. I mean, I think that these discussions have always sort of been maybe a lower priority until now. And I think now that this change in, in our national, just the way that we approach these things has really changed because of these events. We've all started talking about unconscious bias. I feel like we're publishing more about diversity. And I mean, this webinar happened likely because of these events as well. So I think that one positive is that we are now talking about it openly. It's no longer like a hush-hush discussion. It's no longer like we need our one token underrepresented minority for our for our practice. Like that's just not okay anymore. And I think everybody is starting to realize that we need to make real change. So in that way within healthcare and also across so many different organizations in the whole world, this is really becoming a new conversation. And I think that's a really, that's where the first step is starting to talk about it. Yeah, I would agree 100%. 100%. Um, I've had the misfortune, I guess, of saying that I was in Charleston, South Carolina when Walter Scott was shot. And I distinctly remember the community outrage and how it affected, you know, those of us at um, the Medical University of South Carolina. I was there when those practitioners were shot in a church that was a few blocks away from you know where I was working at that time and having to remember having to go to work the next morning knowing that that person was still out there and I think that situation really impacted us locally because it was our community but what we've seen now during this pandemic when everything has been shut down and people can't you know see a killing and just roll on to the next headline and then we have back to back to back just horrendous acts and I think it woke America's consciousness to a degree because those things that were previously ignored, I think healthcare got to the point where they could no longer ignore it. So many times I think the mindset of medicine has been that we are different because we're so educated and we have these people who are altruistic and we're empathetic. But in reality, medicine is just merely a microcosm of society. And until we really sit down and recognize that there's a problem and address it, those things continue to happen. And I think the unfortunate incidents have forced everyone in healthcare, in medicine, and really across the world to really recognize that things have not changed that much over the last however many hundreds of years that we, we thought there had been significant improvement. But in reality, it was just that we were not as awake to the problems that many other people were seeing. Thank you all so much for that con contribution. Dr. Lightfoot, do you want to include anything to any of that? Uh, sure. I, I I would say that one of the beneficial effects of these uh, horrific police murders has been, as Dr. Bradshaw says, the increased sensitivity and understanding on the part of our majority colleagues. Um, I had two people on my board of directors, uh, board of chancellors of American College of Radiology, call me and ask me how I was feeling as a result of the murder of George Floyd. And I said, well, thank you for asking, but uh, this is something that we've lived with uh, in, in our societies of color uh, for, for low these many decades, centuries. Um, and in fact, the American College of Radiology did adopt a, a statement um, in, in support of, uh, of black communities and in, in support of Black Lives Matter. Uh, one of my uh, practice partners called and said, you know, I, I, I hope you're feeling OK through all this. So I, I, I think that uh, sensitivity uh, is a real benefit, uh, not just to individuals, me or, or any one in radiologist, but simply raising the consciousness of some of our majority uh, colleagues and brothers and sisters to the effects of systemic racism and certainly uh, tragic uh, uh, barbaric uh, police killings like we've uh, witnessed lately. Thank you so Thank much you. for contributing this very important and sensitive topic. I really appreciate, we all really appreciate to hear this important information.
Um, Dr. Katari, I know you're having issues with audio, but any chance it's working out? All right. You just said no. Sorry. Can you hear me? Can you guys oh. hear me? Yeah, we hear somebody yep. there. Is that uh, Dr. Katari? Yes, it is. Wow, finally. I apologize. I don't think I've uh, had these many technical issues ever in my life. I apologize. I, my, my computer's just not cooperating today. Um, so, again, many, many apologies for I heard everything that you guys said. And I was like, yeah, I want to add it. I want to add it. And uh, <laughs> I apologize for, uh, for being uh, mute all the time. So, but keep, keep going. I just want to let you guys know I am on. I'm on my phone, um, uh, so um, you probably will just hear me uh, rather than see me. But again, Ryan, sorry to interrupt you. Guys, keep going. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that I finally connected. Do Do you want to um, answer this question by any chance? Since we got you right now. Oh, uh, yes, I I, I do. Um, I first want to give a little bit in terms of why I came here because that will give context. Um, and I want to just say that you know this is this is a hard conversation because I actually come from a, a world of privilege, and even though that may sound strange, you know, super educated parents, not faced racism, you know, living in an ivory tower at Stanford, and so these these conversations are hard because it is it almost feels like being an imposter talking about racism that you haven't. Faced it, and my my heart goes out to all my colleagues who have faced it. Um, you know, the other big advantage I have is I'm a five foot woman, and uh, when it comes to police brutality and stuff, uh, I would almost say it's the exact opposite, where I can, you know, get out of speeding tickets or whatever just because I'm a small woman. So again, I, I do want to um, highlight the fact that you know this is. Um, this is such a hard conversation that a lot of us may not have faced um, firsthand, but it is, it, we hear about it in the news all the time. And especially our patients who are um, in a different socioeconomic um, um, status, right? And so when it came to COVID and especially with George Floyd and Breonna, uh, what I worry about is patients not getting the care that uh, people in upper socioeconomic stand, um, you know, especially with COVID, you know, who's getting the remdesivir, who's getting the monoclonal antibodies, are we giving the same treatment to all of all our patients? And that's where, um, you know, my, my biggest worry lies is, are we making sure there's equity? Thank you so much. It's good to hear from you. All righty. So uh, we would love to hear uh, some more responses. So with this, uh, I know this has been sensitive and a very important topic to discuss. So with that, we want to kind of look at real change in action. So with that, we're just saying we're interested in seeing what it means to move past what has happened and not necessarily move past but make changes in the right direction to make a real change in all aspects of the field as well as uh, social norms and things of the sort so it would be nice to have everybody be able to answer this whether it be one or all three of these little subheading questions but uh, in regards to the change how can racism be addressed in the field of radiology um, so examples that uh, we would love our panelists to be able to answer are if there's any kind of validated tools or training programs that are aimed at reducing racism in the workplace, uh, whether it be in general medicine or radiology. Uh, another good one is where do you feel energy could be directed to make the largest impact um, in regards to discrimination and racism in the field of radiology or medicine? And of course, an incredibly important one, why does representation matter in radiology when it comes to addressing racism? So uh, Dr. Bradshaw, if you would like to start it out and if we can just go down the list. Okay. So 
I don't know of any validated programs that are out there to reduce, um, that have been shown to reduce racism in the workplace. There's a lot of different training programs about unconscious bias, and right now we're trying to roll out anti-racism training at Vanderbilt. But what, what I would say is this, I think it's vitally important to expose people to the issue and to train them as best you can so that you can then hold them accountable because I think that's where you get your impact. So many times I've heard people say, well, I didn't know, or if I had known, I wouldn't have done this. And so by training people, you can then allow them to no longer have the excuse of still keeping the same behaviors that we know are bad. I think um, there are institutional policies out there about how you handle um, racism, discrimination, but I think if you were to uphold the staff that work in these different places, they don't know what the steps are or when things are exposed, that those policies are, are not really enacted and followed through on. So I think if we want to have major impact, you have impact by holding people accountable for their actions. In terms of why representation matters, I think it is vitally important. Um, we know that uh, different populations may have um, better adherence to uh, medical recommendations depending on the, the ethnicity of the, of the provider that has provided that information. But also, I just think about our learners and how tough it is for them coming through these different medical centers and how there's not enough representation of people that look like them and how many people are struggling to find mentors and really access to how do you even become a radiologist there are just so many people that just don't have good access and we could improve that by diversifying the representation of our field thank you so much for that response i i love how you addressed all the questions fantastically uh dr Katari, are you still there at the moment Yes, I am. And Marcus, that was so fantastic that you just sort of fit the whole, all encapsulated in these fantastic ideas um, around how do we make sure that going forward that we, we are in a better place. And so I, I would say, I, I do think a lot of it happens at the microcosm level. Data is, of course, really important. Um, you know, the more data we have, the better. But people live in their own microcosms, right? And so in your own workplace, um, identifying and calling out these behaviors are, are, are probably one of the most important steps of making progress at a, um, at a micro level, at a, at a uh, local level. Um, the other thing, um, and I'm hoping we can do this, is really exposing our own trainees and our own fellows and our own faculty to the different levels of socioeconomic and cultural, right? Almost going through, you know, do you have, um, do we have any exercise or do we actually go out? So for example, at Stanford, you know, how many people go out to East Palo Alto and make sure that those kids kind of um, know what we are about, know what IR is about, know what radiology about. There are some, you'd be amazed at how uh, there are so many fantastic programs that are looking for mentors to help um, economically disadvantaged kids to see, you know, what it, you know to, to expose them to um, some of the better opportunities, right? And so, you know, I, I haven't heard about that many radiology programs getting into the, you know, let's go out and um, talk about radiology. Um, to this group of high schoolers, right? Not not the Palo Alto High School, which is all again economically well off, but the East Palo Alto High Schools, for example, where you, where um, uh, these exercises would expose those kids to to what we have, and ex in, in return expose us to what the, what struggles they face. So that's on a on a more microcosm level, if you will, because I do think changes have to be local to have more of a um, broader impact. Um, in terms of where we, you know, sort of going down the list, where do you feel our energy should be directed for largest impact? I, I think the first answer I gave is, again, I think that's understanding and um, 
feeling it firsthand makes the biggest impact. You can read about all these disparities as much as you want to, but till you don't see it upfront, close and personal, I don't know how much of uh, how much it kind of sinks in. Um, you know, the last question in terms of why does representation matter? I mean, I think if you speak, we do know that having a more diverse background, whether it be by gender, by culture, by race, ethnicity, makes a better workforce. Um, to me, that is, the why is not as hard as how we would get to there. So. Um, I would mention that I just happen to have completed preparing a module with ACR and AMA on implicit bias training. And I put that in the chat. Uh, it's a half hour, I think a one hour CME program that takes the learner through a series of steps uh, to, to learn about implicit bias. Um, the American Medical Association came to the American College of Radiology and our Commission for Women and Diversity and asked, would you help prepare this module? That's free, it's online, it's in the chat. Please uh, let us know what you think of that particular little training module. Uh, likewise, uh, th there are a few other sort of generic, um, widely available methods. The Harvard IAT, the Implicit Association Test, is a good one to take. Uh, it it will show it will show you a lot about yourself. Um, and to the extent that you can get an entire group to take it, an entire class of residents, or an entire department, or an entire division. Um, and then discuss the results, uh, that can be very helpful. Uh, it just really enhances uh, our awareness. Um, and then just, uh, again, one of your last questions there, um, why does representation matter? It's, it's about being at the table and setting the priorities. Uh, to the extent that there is a, uh, an, an African-American vice dean like, like uh, Dr. Bradshaw, he, he will make sure that we are at the table and represented when it comes to issues that are relevant to our community. Likewise, a, a, a Hispanic brother or sister sitting on the dean's council makes a big difference when that dean's office sets priorities. Um, and as Dr. Katari said, it's been well shown uh, it, in, in industry and uh, academics that diverse teams perform better. Um, diversity per se is a performance asset. Uh, and so, you know, one of our, our committee's motto, our commission's motto is excellence through diversity, that, that it's possible to be diverse without being excellent, but you can't really achieve excellence unless you, unless you achieve diversity. If you could distribute that link to everybody, it's uh, free, jump on the AMA website when you have nothing better to do. Especially with a lot of time with uh, COVID, and all that. Um, we can definitely include that in our email that we'll send out after for all our registration. So we'll include that with like a TED talk and a couple other things. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much for that. It was it was great to hear all that from you, Dr. Lightfoot. Uh, Dr. Gupta, Gupta, did you want to follow him up? Sure. So I think everyone has really highlighted the major topics. I was going to, again, discuss mentorship and how important mentorship is in choosing radiology. And like I mentioned earlier, you know, you see the number of underrepresented minorities going up within medical school and within other specialties, and it remains stagnant within radiology. And as everyone's saying, a diverse workforce is a better workforce. And if you're not improving your diversity, you're not going to get there. So for me, I think you should really direct energies to recruitment and to getting more diverse people into radiology, getting a more diverse workforce, because that's the only way we're going to end up with a better radiology workforce in general. It's the only way to improve our numbers. And also, as Dr. Bradshaw mentioned, I was going to say the exact same thing, that you look for people who look like you. And on a personal note, I never thought that that was so important because I don't know, I just never like had a personal interaction that I was like, oh, I really want to meet, you know, a female Indian radiologist. To me, that never occurred to me. But 
I did end up going on an interview for radiology where it was all white men. And I know for a lot of female radiology applicants, that is a normal feeling to be the only female in the room. And all of a sudden, it's this bizarre experience where you're the only person who looks different. And it was at that moment, I realized, okay, this is why representation matters because I feel awkward. I felt like no matter what I said, it was going to be the wrong thing. I ended up being the only person ordering a different meal at dinner. It was just a terrible experience for me. And it had nothing to do with the program and only applicants that were in the room. And so it was in that moment that I was like, this is why representation matters. This is why we need a more diverse workforce. I don't want to be the only female in the room ever again. And that's and that's why future address exists now that's all i can say <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for sharing that personal experience it definitely gives a very unique perspective into uh into interviews let alone representation um so with that um we're really ending the uh towards the end of our conversation right now unfortunately but uh, I just want to include here, um, right here is a QR code that everybody can scan if you would like. Um, and this is, there's also the, uh, in the chat, there will be a Google form link. Um, so this is have you filled out. And like I was saying before, resources will be sent to you. Uh, so things like a couple interesting TED Talks, as well as we can include Dr. Lightfoot's, um, the implicit bias test as well. So I'm just going to hold it here for like 10 more seconds or so. And and again, so if you guys need it, it, the link should be in the chat. So with that, um, I'm going to hand it over back to Christy. So I just want to thank everyone again for all the attendings and all the panelists for giving us such amazing feedback, giving us amazing stories and personal stories that um, I'm sure a lot, of, a lot of us can relate to. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open up the chat box to any of the attendings, um, attendees who, if they have any questions that, that we can ask our panelists. So does anyone have questions? Uh, I just um, <clears throat> take this opportunity to thank all the residents who are interested in and in exploring radiology. <clears throat> One of the things that we found at our commission is that many women and minority uh, medical students don't go into radiology because they conceive of, conceive of it as not being public service, not being a patient care based, not being a helping profession, not helping my community, not helping my people. And that is a myth that all the radiologists on the panel here know it is, is only a myth. Um, and that's one that our commission has tried to dispel. And so I really celebrate your effort um, uh, here at, at Rowan uh, to, to dispel that myth and to show how radiology is a helping profession. Um, we just, we don't have a single patient as our doctor. We have an entire department uh, as, as our doctor. Um, we do as much patient care as we care to, uh, including uh, certainly mammography and certainly interventional radiology uh, can be very much face to face. And um, the, the, the diseases that we care for in uh, screening, particularly in breast cancer and lung cancer screening, are major community services. So um, tell your fellow medical students uh, that radiology is a helping profession every bit as much as pediatrics or OBGYN. Um, I do have a few questions, if you guys don't mind. Um, so I, one question is, it was mentioned that we should attempt to speak up when noticing racist acts or remarks. As physicians in training who are constantly being evaluated judge, is there a safe method to address these concerns without being penalized? That's a great question. Yeah. That That is a great question. Um, so I think we can't have the onus just be on the residents and our learners. Um, we as attendings have to take the onus upon ourselves 
So I know one of the things that I do is I frequently ask those difficult questions. So I ask my residents, you know, how are things going? How are you feeling? And the thing that I will tell any attending that's out there is that your learners are going through a lot, be it based off of their ethnicity or their gender, and they won't tell you. They will just suck it up and put their head down and wait three or four years until their residency program is over. And so if you haven't built that rapport with your residents, then they're not going to come to you when there are issues. So we, we have to build those relationships, make it known that we, are, we want to know when there are problems, and then also provide a safe mechanism for them to let us know. So at Vanderbilt, we created an anonymous reporting mechanism so that anyone could um, come to uh, that link and put in the details, even if it wasn't the person. It could be someone who witnessed it. They could put down what they saw and it comes to myself and then I will follow up and talk to the individuals that are involved. And so I just think it's so important that we create a culture that values diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then we do everything that's possible to protect said culture. Wow, that's amazing. I'm so glad you mentioned that because a lot of students, a lot of residents, um, they are scared. So for you to create something like that where they can be open and just honest, that's amazing where you can build that relationship and um, bridge that gap. Um, I, our next I would, question. I, I, would, I would just suggest one more method is talk to your peer about it. If you if you witness a, an, an episode that you, that you find upsetting and particularly racist and you don't quite know how to, to go to your superior or to the supervisor, talk to someone who, who is like you. And th again, this is an illustration of how we need more people uh, who look like us and, and get a feeling of how you might approach it from, from a, a, a literal peer. Christy, I'd like to add something to what both Dr. Weitz had said and Dr. Bradshaw said. Um, yes, please. And to Dr. Gupta's point, uh, number one is you're finding people who look like you. But the other thing, and I think this is on, um, the onus is on faculty, is if you see behavior that is, that you may cringe at or you don't think is appropriate or you think so, or you see a trainee cringe at but it's just not being verbal about it, um, I, I think the faculty need to speak up about it, right? So you call out your own colleagues and your own if if that uh, behavior is is in some way or the other knowingly or unknowingly unacceptable, right? Not not everything is you know somebody may say something not aware of what the what the implications are, for. and so calling that out. Um, and again, calling that out with just data and with facts and saying, hey, X, Y, Z, you said this, and this is what the interpretation may be, um, is important. Because again, you can only change things if you call it out at that particular time. Um, for the trainees, I'll tell you, every GME, and you should check with your GME, but there should be a way to uh, anonymously um, speak up. Um, most GMEs, most AC GMEs will will have that provision because we all know that trainees don't want to speak up um, with, you know, in, in the fear that they will be um, penalized. And so there should be mechanisms at your training institute that allow you for anonymous, um, I wouldn't call it complaints, but anonymous um, reporting of behavior. Wow, that was a great answer. Thank you so much, Dr. Katari. Um, our next question is, in terms of specific areas of radiology, like breast imaging or neuro, where do you see the most growth and or lack of diversity? And that question is open to anyone. <clears throat> So I'll take that stab at it from an IR perspective, given that there are 9% of um, IRs are women, right? So there, there's good news and bad news in both of that, in that it is dismal that only, you know, the number of women in IR is in single digits. The good news, though, is if you look at the pipeline, the trainee, um, trainees coming through, the number of women going into IR is uh, rising exponentially. 
It's still not at 50%. We are way below that, but we, we are definitely making a lot of headway. So if you look at the last 20 years versus what I think the next 20 years will be, um, there's a huge, uh, there's just growth. And I think IR is looking very exciting um, in terms of the number of women and number, of, I still think we do, you're doing, you're not doing as good a job with minorities, underrepresented minorities. But we are moving in that direction, so there, there's hope in that. I'm glad to hear that. Um, I know we're running short on time now, so I just want to ask one more question. It seems that we tend to flock to programs and institutions that are more diverse. What, what do you recommend institutions do to help improve the diversity in their departments? Well, oh, that's that's a yeah, That's Dr. a great Bradshaw, question. You've been, you've been very successful. <laughs> you've been very successful. <laughs> I, I hear it in so many different levels. I've heard people say that we have a difficult time um, diversifying our faculty, which can which can be difficult. Um, I think it it starts by having true pipeline program, and I would love to see one that's linked all the way down to to high school. To be honest with you, or elementary school, so that we could track these. These, these students and keep them in place. Um, but the, the thing that I would tell people is this, if you take a, an external outlook on things and you pour into other individuals, then they are more likely to want to come to your program. If you, you mentor people, they're more likely to stay. So when people say, I can't get enough minority faculty, for example, I tell them, then work on your residence Diversify your residency program and treat those residents well enough that they want to stay. The problem is so many times diversity can be a talking point because everyone realizes that I must say diversity, equity, and inclusion is important. But then when it comes down to it, they don't want to put any effort behind it. And so effort, well, Yasha talked about it earlier, you know, there's not enough mentoring in radiology, number one. Um, there's not enough exposure. Um, there's not enough people that are really willing to not only say that diversity is important, but actually put it in your rank list. Let's, let's be blunt. Like you can't say diversity is important, but then say, I only want to risk getting one person in my program because if I get two, I don't know what's going to happen. And I think that's what happens in a lot of programs. Um, so put it in your rank list and things that are important to you, then you, you, you act on it. And it starts at the top of these different programs. So if the chairman is on board and the program director is on board then you can get some traction but if those two things aren't there and you put somebody in a diversity role but they don't have any power to diversify the program then you won't get any results and so it has to be a top-down effort where everyone's truly involved and i think you have to make it known what i said earlier is that the culture we value diversity at this particular program because what happens is if that student comes in and yes, the, the program director says diversity is important, but they talk to another faculty member who's like, I don't know what you're talking about diversity. Please believe that happens to these students when they're interviewing. And so we have to make sure that everyone that's interacting with students on interview day knows that diversity is important to us as a program. And so there's no one fix that we can do, but we have to make sure that we are making collective efforts in our individual programs to make diversity uh, a true initiative. Very well I, said. Oh, sorry. Can I add something really quickly? Yes, go for it. So within residency programs, it can be a little bit difficult to improve diversity because ultimately it comes down to a rank and you never know who you're going to get. And that's especially true for small programs like Mount Auburn. We only get three a year. And so you can go, you know, many years without getting great diversity and that may be no fault of your own. But I will say if that ends up being you and you're in a program where you feel like you want more diversity, look around. You can connect with programs that are in the area. I'm in Boston and so we've connected with MGH. We've connected, you know, you can find people that have similar interests as you in different programs. It doesn't have to just be within your program and you can still help create diversity within radiology. You don't have to always stay within your institution. Ultimately, you do want to bring it back to your institution, but 
there's always way there's there are ways to start and you can start small and you can connect with people that may not be in your institution because growth happens at every level and if that's what you need to do i think that all faculty members would be supportive of that thank you for that dr gupta that was very well said also um i just want to go ahead and end with one last question because we're all learners um, what literature would you recommend in educating ourselves on racism bias and how to address it? There is a, a, an expanding literature in the radiology literature. Journal of American College of Radiology um, has, uh, they actually have a diversity collection uh, curated by Elizabeth Hawk uh, and a, a few of the other senior radiologists. There's a whole diversity collection. It's been out about a year, <clears throat> but there's a substantial amount of literature that's being added to the radiology literature specifically about diversity. J just as a reminder, graduating medical students are about 16% people of color. Radiology residents are about 8% people of color. So that's the specialty gap that we can exploit to make radiology more diverse. And some of those articles in JACR uh, go a long way to talking about how we can do that. Thank you so much, Dr. Lutz. Okay. Sorry, I interrupted. I apologize. No, go ahead, Dr. Kotari. The thing so JACR, I think, is fantastic, but. Um, with uh, some of the diversity uh, uh, information, so is radiology. But I often will go to non-radiology journals also to see um, sort of read on it. I mean, some of the linguistic journals with linguistic data on it is, is, you know, that was sort of one of the ideas that came about was based on an uh, article that I saw on um, in computational science and linguistics. Um, so I would say, you know, just don't go to specialty journals, unfortunately, are notorious for not having um, too much on diversity. Like, for example, JDIR is still lagging behind the more, um, you know, the JACRs of the world. Um, but the other thing I would, since, you know, this is a young crowd, I would say the other thing that's important is also to start publishing your own data if this is something that's near and dear to you. Um, it'd be amazing. Uh, Oh, you'd be amazed how much just looking at your institutional data will teach you. Um, and, and so a lot of the studies that I've published were based out of just, you know, conversations around uh, the lunch table and, you know, some ideas people had or something that they would have personal experience and then dwelling into it in, in terms of your institution and seeing what's out there or, you know, what, what the data shows. So I would say don't, you know, don't fear... Um, digging into your own institution's data to publish it and adding to the world of uh, diversity literature. And if I could add one thing, I put um, a link to our VUNC Office of Health Equity. We have an anti-racism hub, so it has articles, it's got videos, it's got movies, whatever flavor you need to get a good introduction <laughs> or more knowledge to the to the different topics, it's in there. And so. I highly encourage you to go to that website and take a look. Thank you so much, Dr. Bradshaw, for that, um, and including that resource. Um, just our last slide, we want to go ahead and just thank all our panelists once again for taking the time out to spend with us, just um, helping us better understand this topic. Um, just giving us personal examples it was very amazing it was so informative and um i hope all of our attendings enjoyed and learned something from this tonight uh, we encourage all of you to contribute to eliminating racism and discrimination wherever you go speak up for yourself and others and i just want to leave everyone with one thought don't be benign don't close your eyes don't shut your eyes uh ears don't let this be a moment but a movement to get up and take action Thank you. Um, and lastly, I wanna also invite everyone here tonight to an introduction to radiology webinar, which is going to take place on November 2nd at 7.30 with Dr. Gupta, who's on the panel tonight, um, to answer some questions from students of radiology and how to get more involved. So we're gonna go ahead and link that in the chat box also. Thank you again. <laughs>